good. It's good to be here. Studio. Good to be back. We've got things to do. we got things They're to things. talk about. You're a very busy man. I know that I am, you. Uh, you know, no rest for the weary. Or the yeah. wicked. I can't remember which oh, one it is. I don't is. know. I think maybe But I am weary and wicked. That's all I got to say. <laughs> all right. We got to get these mics in a little closer. That's all I'm going to say to you. Here we go. Look, look, look. We're off and going. So what's, what's on your mind, my friend? I mean, we've got a lot going on. So um, I know we've been to some movies. I know yeah, you, you, you said you want to talk about, about this you, uh, because of you, I went to see that Quentin Tarantino movie. Okay. You can blame uh, yeah, me. The Lion the King. Yeah. <laughs> The the Tarantino King? King. No, I didn't. That's that's not that's not the movie. That wasn't it. Made. Oh no. man, that explains things because yeah, I was that like, was a lot of why are all these? Okay. Yeah, all these animals like you know, and they look creepily real, but they didn't have like facial expressions. So it really threw me off. I don't know if you've seen this no, Lion King. No, I haven't seen uh, yeah, the Tarantino a, Lion King movie. Yeah, yeah just, there was yeah. a lot of cursing because Sam Jackson but, played a hyena. Yeah, see, Sam Jackson's <laughs> always in these movies. All right, so. That movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Once Upon, yeah, that, this, okay, Once Upon that a was, Time in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that title tells us a little bit about where this thing is going, it if does. we paid attention. Yeah, that's right. Most right, of us did not. We just went in to see what yeah, was Yeah, a lot, lot of people there. weren't thinking that this, this was a, a fairy tale of sorts, right? A, yes, a, it a, was. A, a fantasy construction. Yes, and, and in a way, um, you know, I enjoyed the movie. I said that to you mm-hmm. before because mm-hmm. I think it fits all the stereotypes. Mm-hmm. I think from you did the 60s, say you were uh, that I could, you were upset that there wasn't a more male nudity, but I thought you know <laughs> I did <laughs> not say that, okay, sorry, and sorry. I can tell you that didn't happen. <laughs> all right, so uh, this is a it was a great movie. I enjoyed it, really it so much, yeah. and I wonder what made it so great. And we mm-hmm. want to talk about that a little bit, but I also want to get Floyd's perspective on this. What else? Where, where else? What, what, we gonna, we, what, what else are we gonna go? It, it won't be Ayn Rand. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Not this time. All right, good deal, man. So um, I think the movie's been around uh, long enough now that mm. we we may have to say spoiler alert. Maybe yeah, if, right. Uh, there there will be some folks spoilers. Who haven't seen it. There so will be big spoilers. Big spoilers because we're going to break this thing down just yeah, a little bit. The end is is really important. Yeah, I think so because I had um, I have to I have to admit going in and knowing the subject matter, I was a little. Sp- worried that this was going to become a documentary mm-hmm. and I was going to see some things I did not want yeah, to see. Yeah, could have been, yeah, some, some so bad things. I'm, bad glad, things. I'm glad it changed and went a different route. I was expecting, however, the over-the-top violence that he's yes. known for in and his he, movies. He did, he did give you some, but not in the way you expected. <laughs> not in the way you expected. And um, just to preface all this, I mean, I was, I was, I was aware that the audience... Um, that I went with, that uh, these guys were uh, gasping and laughing yeah, almost right. at the same time. You're right. So I found that to be rather that's interesting, interesting because uh, he, he yeah. tweaked some things there that um, he needed to tweak to get the reaction from the audience. So I thought that was uh, in- incredible. So, uh, mm-hmm. all right, I'm a fan of the movie, but I know we got to break this thing down because uh, there was some controversy. There was. Uh, Bruce Lee, was that, that, that's, that, that caused some controversy. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, I've I've seen on the uh, on the interweb there that people on the Bruce Lee camps uh, said, "Hey, look, you you're uh, you're mm-hmm. casting this guy in a bad light. Yeah. You've made him look like a you know a narcissist of some sort and mm-hmm. uh, bragging about things, <laughs> and then you allowed. Well, I guess this is a spoiler alert, but but you allowed the. Um, um, the person that was playing a stunt man, mm-hmm. uh, Brad Pitt, to beat the crap out of uh, mm-hmm. Bruce Lee. Now, mm-hmm. I don't remember that happening in real life. <laughs> so yeah, and it's, uh, not, it's not a yeah. But people really they went through the analysis of that and sort of broke it down. But mm-hmm. that was, I mean, that was actually that was a intentional thing. I think yeah. that um, part of the Tarantino fairy tale did. element. I think maybe. What what, what, what is because I, I meant to look at this because how was Tarantino responded to this? Is he? Uh, I heard them say he doubled down, but I don't know if he, what his reasoning was. I, I, I don't know myself. Yeah. I didn't see his exact quote on that. I know it's out there. We yeah. may have to look that up. Yeah, maybe pull that's it up a, here at some point. Did he? Uh, yeah. You know, my my thought would be because, and and maybe that w- when we get into sort of the general themes of the film, but that um, I, I thought of a couple of things as to why that might have happened. First off, you you said it once upon a time in Hollywood. It, it is. It's a it's a fairy tale. Sure. Way. Sure. And so he had a chance to rewrite all sorts of things. Right. And in rewriting them, I um uh the character that beats up Bruce Lee represents um old Hollywood, represents um uh old 
lots of things. Uh, he uh, was a, a cowboy and a stunt man, and he represents sort of um, the Marlboro Man masculinity. Right. And I wonder to what degree Bruce Lee doesn't represent, just like the hippies who are sort of villainized in the movie too, right. the changes that are coming. And, right. Um, it almost was a marker in time that you could see mm-hmm. that that was happening. The uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character mm-hmm. sort of been in the westerns with mm-hmm. a big star, and then, mm-hmm. um, you know, his career was winding down. He had yeah. to go uh, for other movies, Italian maybe some roles he didn't want. He spaghetti ended up westerns. doing the spaghetti westerns. And it was interesting. Uh, he could do four movies in like a month or something. Like he was gone. Right. I don't know how many long he was, <laughs> right. but he did all these movies in like I don't know. <laughs> but you, but you know, um, I mean, uh, Clint Eastwood. That's mm-hmm. uh, Steve that started McQueen. his career. Well, Steve yeah, and, and I, I think that so. was an homage in some uh, nodding to that. And Steve McQueen also was played a bounty hunter on a TV show that ended, and all that sort of stuff. So Clint Eastwood, Steve McQueen, these sort of um, you know uh, icons yes. of Western. Of, yeah, uh, Western, the, uh, the masculine, yeah. Marlboro man kind of stuff. And I, there were several instances where you could almost see as if he was trying to create a story where they they were able to win. Right. That somehow they were able to, you know, to overcome or to maintain. Because it, it's in some ways it's it's the fairy tale is about old Hollywood. About, right, because, um, I, I mean, in all those Westerns, mm-hmm. I grew up in the uh, 50s and 60s watching those, those uh, Westerns. Uh, a good guy always won. Yeah. Uh, at the end, things worked out. Hey, got the girl, got the bad guy. Which is actually sort of happens in this film because, on on several levels, you know, um, and maybe the, the, I was going to just mention one other thing with the Bruce Lee thing. Sure. I don't know if this is relevant or sure, not. Sure, maybe we need to go back and start from the beginning. We'll run through this. But I I like um, there is um, you know Tarantino is sort of um, he takes sort of low culture and sort of amplifies it so. The films that he typically riffs on are, um, you know, um, B movies and Grindhouse pictures and, um, you know, uh, uh, kung fu. What do, what do they call them? They called them chop suey. Is what was the term? Whatever, whatever the right, term right. for for the uh, chop shop, chop something, whatever they call them. And I wonder if if um, in some ways he has something against Bruce Lee for becoming the sort of the. Uh, the sort of star that um, oh, oh, he overshadowed all the other folks that he may have some interest in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sure. That he was sort of culturally accepted in a way that then marginalized other folks that he thought may have been better suited or um, uh, should have gotten that limelight. And I wonder if in some ways this wasn't a chance for him to sort of, you know, consciously or unconsciously sort of play out that beef and this time put Bruce Lee in his place. I yeah, I mean, it really yeah. did seem like he put Bruce Lee in it his really, place. Yeah. And uh, that sounded, in, I mean, it seemed intentional. Yeah. So I, I've got to go with that. Also, I think he was kind of into, he's kind of into the shock value of things and what it's going to do to people to see a yeah. favorite icon get trashed uh, to a certain extent. <laughs> yeah, he might, he might have got that there was... Um, yeah, here's, here's one in your eye. Here's yeah, a stick in your eye right yeah, there. He, he's, he's all about... Um, um, uh, well, what's the? I, I I lost the term, um, but he's all about being able to um, to uh, um, to. Uh, I'll think of the term later. But there there is a term for that sort of shock value that um, sure. yeah you. But uh, uh, it'll it'll come back. All right. So I, in a, in a way, this um, it it's it had so many different sides to it. So you can pick out your favorite parts mm-hmm. um, in this movie because it was the. Back in the 60s, innocent, more innocent time, mm-hmm. uh, and there was a lot of that playfulness throughout. Mm-hmm. But also some of the um, the real things that happened, the ranch that these hippies went to with yeah. Charles Manson. Charles Manson, yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, going up the driveway, they had the... Uh, uh, they were going to do this terrible deed, and of course, in this movie, I won't, uh, no reason to spoil that one, but it turns around at the very end. You know, the girl, one of the girls actually left, and that was true part of uh, what happened. That was the true. Family. That was true, that there was one that, that just ducked out um, uh, right before the deed. Mm hmm. So, mm-hmm. um, which was kind of an interesting idea. So he, he really took some real life situations which i was worried about the documentary thing coming out and we're gonna oh no i think we've been there but um it's kind of mixed it in with that fantasy and that romantic side of things too well i think and that part of that's what when you said what made the movie good 
is first of all it's a very long movie and yes. he creates a space that you live in like he makes the cinematography uh the color palette all these things yes. create a space that you become comfortable with it's almost when the movie ends you're sort of sad that you can't go back there right there's a, the cars. There is that feeling. Right. I think I had that. <laughs> really, you're like, like I, I, I guess it, it sort of manifested in itself saying, okay, I'm going to watch this movie again. Right. I want to go back. Go back and I want to be able to, because it, it literally, it, it maybe in some ways, one of the main characters is just this vision of Hollywood that, because there, there are these extended scenes of um, the Margot Robbie's character, which is Sharon Tate, where she is goes to a movie theater and she's watching herself on the screen at this, I think it's called The Wrecking Crew, which is a Dean Martin film. Right. And we're watching her. And, and I was sort of well, I'm sorry, around. I don't mean to question, but uh, was was Sharon Tate actually in yes, that? So that, had, that portrait. I think that was a real, real okay. Sharon Tate. I, I, I thought it was, but I didn't and, know for sure, not having seen the movie. And so. it just creates this sort of, you know, you're, you're living in this space. And he really makes use of, even the, the, places where it's really tense like the ranch where the hippies live right. it's still interesting that something like that could exist that there was an old hollywood lot that had been taken over by hippies right and, and by the way uh my friend bruce dern mm -hmm. uh was in that as the old man and it seems right. like the the hippies moved in and mm -hmm. he was the elderly mm -hmm. kind of get having some pro medical problems and they just sort of took over the ranch mm -hmm. which i found that could happen. That probably, well, I don't I, know. I, mean, I, don't I think know that's, that's one of the, the narratives of the film. The hippies are about to take over. We're seeing the, um, it is, the 60s are coming to a close, and what they have, and they're, it, this is about, to, it, this, it's, I think 1969 is when this takes place. Right. Things are going to radically change as a result of that. And so in some ways, you know, um, how we define masculinity what movies look like. And even the character of Roman Polanski, he represents sort of what's about to happen. You right. Know? Yeah. He's not, um, you, have to, you have to go to Italy to make a Western anymore? I mean, that's yeah. literally... That, 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 that was very sad. And, and uh, uh, Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio's, um, I mean, he was struggling there. That was mm -hmm. some real depression there. Mm -hmm. And uh, had the little girl in the scene trying to kind of rescue him <laughs> a little bit back from some of that and to make it okay. Then he ends up marrying a woman, an Italian woman, and bringing her back. And he's mm -hmm. tr really trying to, you know, re-energize all of that. His hairstyle changes radically. <laughs> you notice when he comes back, there's a whole. He's gained weight. He has a different hair. It, like literally, he is. He's not what he was when he left. But you know, one one thing I might. And this may be taking it out of uh, where we were headed, but no, okay. you mentioned that the Freudian thing. Like one of the ways that I sort of thought about it as I was watching it is, if you want to think about it from a Freudian perspective, in a way, it's a trauma narrative. Mm -hmm. And it's a trauma narrative on several levels because I think uh, Tarantino's in his 50s, mid-50s, I think. So right. uh, you know, he, 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 he is, I think, same, same for both of us. We know about the Charles Manson stuff, Helter sure. Skelter. It, it's sort of part of our culture. We know that. Yes. So he stages a film set, and the narrative trajectory is heading directly toward that event. Right. But he stops it from happening. Sharon Tate is saved at the end. Mm -hmm. Her and her baby, everybody's fine. And and so it's and it's, the bad guys get their just get, due, you know. Boy, did they get their just due. Boy, did they really <laughs> they get, get their due. They really. <laughs> and he literally. He, so he he. It's a little like um, Inglorious Bastards, where Hitler gets. You know, they mow down Hitler. Right. Um, he he creates a historical well, I say narrative. Hello to my little friend. Yeah, it was, uh, situation there. It was okay. And I, I I think there's something important about that about how he is, and it works. It cuts across two ways. Aesthetically, in a way, if you are aware of what happened to Sharon Tate. It actually throws it, it makes it even more poignant because when the film ends, part of you realizes by not saying it, by not even hinting at it, by not letting it happen, it makes it even more real in some ways. Yes. Because you're going like, yes. well, that would be wonderful if that happened. That would, but, but, but it, did not not, <laughs> it did not happen in any way. It but I also think, incident. I also think that it, it represents, you know, um, Tarantino was a, a, attempting to generate a fairy tale that erases both um and, and in, i i wonder if he c it sort of conflates her death with the death of the sort of hollywood that he that probably never really existed 
but right. one that he sort of is attempting to be able to pay homage to and maybe even resurrect. And right. so there's a number of like narrative moments or traumatic moments that I think he's attempting to. Um, and one would think about this Freudian way is that, you know, art is supposed to do one or two things. It's supposed to either uh, cover over the void or show it to you in a way that's bearable. And I think okay. this is a pretty good example, at least on several levels, where he's attempting to cover it up, but maybe also in a way to show it to you, too. Hence the way that, you know, at the end of it, you're aware of what really happens. Right. And so in a sense, it makes it even more palpable that, you know, you, you can now, a tired old story about something horrible that happens now has flesh and blood to it in a way that it didn't before in a lot of a fairy tale where it's, where you know it's undone, uh. right? So it's, it's almost like this this need we have to uh, band aid over, mm -hmm. uh, cover over some of that grief and horror that we mm -hmm. all knew that took place, and mm -hmm. really um, added to a turbulent time in mm -hmm. our history. It's 1969, the Vietnam War was still going on. Yeah, in and fact, lots of things happening. And you'll notice that there is bare, there's just small mention the character of. Um, 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 uh, the the cowboy uh, um, stuntman mentions that he had been in Brad war. Pitt. Brad Pitt, yes, yes, his character. So there's there's it's even though the Vietnam War might be going on, we don't really catch but only hints of it. Even though the you know that there are all these cultural events that have that have transpired, we only get hints of them. I mean, it's like um, they're they're if at best in the background, right? Right. And um, and this is an, an aside too, but I think mm -hmm. I was tracking the moments where um, people seem to be hypnotized by TVs. Right. There are all these moments <laughs> where everybody is sort of sitting in front of a TV right. and whatnot. TV dinner, the whole. And thing, there's yeah. a scene where um, uh, Brad Pitt's character, he's called uh, is it Cliff? Cliff. Cliff. And I think that was may have been even based on a true is movie it a, star um, stuntman from the day. Really? So there is a, so maybe there is a person yeah. back there that they somehow connected they to put, him. I don't know. Well, he, he drives, his house is this, this this small trailer behind a movie theater, and there's a scene where he's where we just see glimpses of the drive-in theater, and he's, he, he doesn't look at the drive-in theater. He goes in and he turns the TV on and just sort of sits down in front of it. And I, I got the sense that there were this this notion that, you know, there was also this conflict between TV and movies too that was sort of in the background on this thing. Right. You know, right. the hippies or the the Manson's hippies were just sort of sitting around watching the TV. That's what they were right, doing. They were. Weren't they, they were just yeah. sort of. That you is know, a very interesting notion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like okay, the the death of movies in some mm -hmm. ways too. That uh, mm -hmm. you know, with that drive-in uh, there, mm -hmm. and all, all of a sudden everybody's watching TV and kind of glued to it like a robot. So also, th this may be not relevant at all, but there's a scene with and uh, is is it um, Dakota Fanning who plays the um, the young girl who sort of entices Cliff to the ranch? I can't. I don't know who that is. Yeah, I don't know either. I, it, it could very well be. Well, he's 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 picked her up and they're heading to the ranch and there's some suggestion that you know that this could end in but and she even at one point at solicits sex from him, oral sex. Right. And his reply is, you know, I can tell you're underage and you know, I'm not gonna and so all this has transpired, it's sort of shocking and there's this tension. And then she sits on his lap, but when she raises her arm, she has armpit hair. Yes. <laughs> and I okay. think what's interesting is of oh, all that the was things, intentional too, yeah, by the way, saying, don't you think? I mean, come on now. But what I think what meant what it meant was is that, and I, I may be wrong, but I think it was digitized. Like, I think that was not her <laughs> armpit hair. That he digitized put her, armpit it looked, hair? It, look, it didn't look real. I'm like, that Did doesn't I look real. That? Okay, but yeah. um, right. what had transpired up until that point wasn't really the shocking thing. It was her armpit hair. Yes, <laughs> that yes. was the part that was like yes. she's got armpit here. Whereas yeah. oh, the there, was, there were there, there were others of those. I remember the 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 phone, the cell phone thing, looking as big as a uh, you know yeah, uh, the, uh, lunch box or something in that. Well, yeah, so looks like he was going to call and, it an and, airstrike. Right, right, and the, and of course the um, the audience all made laughed at those particular <laughs> things. So I think he placed those in there. Yeah. Well, well, what I mean, it, it, there was a lot of humor, a lot of laughter yeah. um, during this time, but but also um, there was violence. There was a mm -hmm. lot of violence at coming. The end. And you almost it was building up. There was tension at different mm -hmm. moments through um, various sort of uh, the parts from the ranch and the, the, mm -hmm. the, the fight scene and something like that was going to happen and mm -hmm. uh, flat tire and so on and so on. But um, 
in the violence, um, you know, he sort of set it up, and I think everybody was waiting for it. So at one point, when they showed the movie scene of him using a flamethrower, <laughs> and guess then Nazis. guess what? At Man, the end, so he there keeps you it are. in his in his. What he said, I. Lucky I keep my this flamethrower in my um, shed in pool, out back. Pool, yes. <laughs> and it was true because that's well, where. Well, he, he was about to miss everything, uh, but all of a sudden he got a clue, and then he was back in character taking out the Nazis again. <laughs> he went and uh, got the... Uh... <laughs> so that, that was very funny. I, I, I think it was a, a real interesting movie. I think sometimes in the previous Tarantino movies, there was just this gratuitous thing like... Mm -hmm. gratuitous uh, violence mm -hmm. that that it was just mm -hmm. over the top all the mm -hmm. way and it sh it was had a shock factor in this particular uh, movie i think he sort of built that up yeah, it was titrated it sort of yeah. came at uh, i will say it's interesting because some of the folks their criticism of of tarantino was that he that some of the most shocking violence often occurs with women and um though there was a yeah. man it was there was a scene where um, Cliff continually pounds this woman's head into things until right. you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and he's you know, and and hard to and, describe. <laughs> and uh, on one level, it sort of played up to be comical because it just seems yes. so over the top. Yes, but at the and same time, horrific. <laughs> yeah, horrific. <laughs> but it is the fact that it was a teenage girl that is the you know that this is a grown adult male killing a teenage girl by beating her head into things. All that sort of comes across. I don't know. There, there is something a little, you know. In, you, you could, you could question some things about what, what yeah. might be going on for that. Yeah. To make a, that decision. A, 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 and, and in some ways, I was looking at that. I thought of this too. That the idea of uh, <clears throat> what happened to those were sort of retribution mm -hmm. for the real that happened. He played mm -hmm. it out in the movie that they got <laughs> yeah, they, what was coming they, to yeah. them. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> the this. events that happened were so horrific. Oh, they were. They were oh, just. Gosh, they were. You can't even describe this. They were things. horrible. horrible. And I think, and in some ways, they were so horrible that even Tarantino couldn't top them. I don't care how over the top right. that violence was. <laughs> yeah. There's no way he would have been able. I mean, to... anytime you pull out a flamethrower on <laughs> in a and on it a person, still pales so, in on. comparison to what still really happened. Still pales in comparison. But uh, that's absolutely absolutely right. So. Um, I don't know. I think there was a lot into it. It did put a lot of thought into it. For example, I think the character uh, DiCaprio played, the uh, sort of aging Western mm -hmm. uh, icon and mm -hmm. star, yeah. um, really, um, he went through some of the emotional trauma, and he was in his trailer, and he's throwing things around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to blow your my brains out if you don't do... Uh, I'm going to... He said that I'm, that that's that's interesting. He said if if you don't do well, I'm gonna go home, blow your brains out. Yeah, that's woo. Uh, <laughs> here's the thing, though. What was interesting is did you notice that, you know, that he then went back and he did a wonderful job acting. Sure. And absolutely. the little girl says that's the best acting I've ever seen. And then his character starts crying. Right. So th there's almost this moment of redemption. There's almost this, even though it, it may be true that his career is slipping, in some ways he is he is doing the best that maybe he's ever done in the face of all these these odds. So there, there's there's right. something redemptive right. about that. I think. Yeah. You know something, and I I think it plays overall against this this. And I I know I seem stuck on it, but I I think that part of what often happens in a traumatic narrative is there's a dissociative element. So there's the 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 traumatic uh, narrative often undoes something, and so I think Tarantino is trying to not only save Sharon Tate, but save the save the Marlboro Man, save some element of of um, of old Hollywood, and so at each level I think he's trying to he's he's sort of trying to bring that even the character of Cliff because he comes up to be um, in many ways sort of a hero of the film right. because he's protecting sure. his friend. Yes. He says, and one of the last things we hear from Cliff is he's going away in the highway seat and he says, thanks for being a friend, for being such go. a good friend. And what he says, I try. Right? <laughs> and, uh, right, right. That nice. was, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, he, and he, he, there is there is a hero. And in some ways, uh, DiCap who's DiCaprio? Uh, his name was Blake. Is that his name? Yes. Blake, yes, I yes, think. Yes, Blake. Blake. And in the end, he also ends up being sort of sort of a, a hero of, of the narrative too but uh, and the cliff character we find out that he had um, killed his wife 
and it looks like from one of the flashbacks because she was he was holding a uh, harpoon gun and she was really berating him and that it's a good looks like he may have shot her <laughs> yeah so um okay i don't know what actually i remember that but i'm not until sure i knew I think what the, to do the, with that the, the, basically the, 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 the implication is that you know he just shot her with a harpoon gun. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Trying hard to like him, but now we got to well, figure out what happened. But I think happened. even that, as opposed to that, still makes him a uh, a likable character of sorts. Oh, there's yeah. still there's something there's something about you know he um, his loyalty his uh, and I, I guess whenever you construct a fairy tale, whenever you generate fantasy elements, you are you. Um, you uh, take things that have a certain element of truth in them, and you you blow them up. You make them more than they are, and, and that's this is right. a fairy tale about Hollywood. Yeah, and uh, hence a title. And mm -hmm. um, I I also think that there were certain times, and I, it came as a relief to me, but there were certain mm -hmm. <coughs> scenes where it was just Brad Pitt in a Hawaiian shirt. Uh, driving down the highway in one yeah. of these old cars back yeah. in that time, and, and, and driving I, by other old cars. Like yeah, I was yeah, counting. I love the cars. There, okay, there was sorry, there were several old Porsches. I think there was an Aston Martin at one point, uh, an MG. So there are all these yeah, cars yeah. that are just sort but, of. But it, it, for me, it was like, okay, this is the carefree time of the '60s, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it was a little bit of relief in the movie from the mm -hmm. tension that was mm -hmm. beginning to build in mm -hmm. some ways. I, um, so yeah, it had to be that long maybe to get all of those things. Well, in and you there. mentioned the build and the tension because you know I, I didn't read any spoilers, so I had no idea what was going to happen. Right. I thought we were heading towards something really bad. Oh yes, and exactly. You keep that e even to the point where they're walking up to somebody's house and they you knew it was coming. You thought right. it was going to be oh, her. Here we go. But instead, they op they ring on and Cliff opens the door. Right. And but oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Because it built up right to that. So moment. you you yes, you just yes. thought, man, this is about and and here we go. And he's on acid, so you think he's ineffectual. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so as he opened totally the door, cool. you're thinking, you know, I don't. I mean, these are these are teenage teachers, but he's he's sort of. So you you think that he's been rendered ineffectual. Right. 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 And turns uh, out, no, no, not exactly. <laughs> and neither is his dog, by it, the way, which is <laughs> so. also a thing. Like you know, the, the whole time and. <laughs> and what I kept thinking was, oh, no, he's trained this dog so well that they're going to be killing him and the dog can't get off the couch because right, the right. dog won't move. Right. <laughs> and, you know. Hey, dog, uh, one of my favorite characters in and the, the dog, entire <laughs> when the dog <laughs> movie. Moves. I think everybody appreciated the dog in the audience I sat with. So The dog could move. There's no uh, way around that. I knew what to do. <laughs> no, that exactly. Was, yeah. What to do in this in this. Well, which is an aside. One of the things, I don't know if you've seen Inglorious Bastards. But yes, sure. Been a while. The opening scene, Tarantino is is a master of creating that sort of tension, because I don't know if you remember the opening scene where this family is held, they're hiding under the floor where this Nazi guy oh, is coming yes, in. Oh yes, yes. Oh. And he plays that out. That guy. And was that incredible. scene lasts like twenty minutes, I think. Yes, long and scene. And it is, the in a way, tension just right, continues to build. And Tarantino is excellent that he did, he did that with you know because they're, they're, I mean it's it's a couple of minutes where he's holding the gun at Cliff. And we're not sure what's going to happen. Right. Even the tension is, you know, they're walking up and they pause and there's some sort of comedic banter between the, you know, the hippie folks and there's all these sorts of things going on and and um, uh, all of that sort of builds and builds and builds and then boom and then there's a flamethrower. Yeah, and they and they did the um, they did the same thing on the ranch where they had to go. Yeah. She had to ride off to get the guy to come back to deal with Cliff, mm -hmm. you know, and. Um, so, uh, that, and the, that, that when he's at the screen door, scene. when he, he's wanting to get in, right, and then he goes back to talk to the guy, oh, and, yes, and then you finally realize they were telling the truth. But up until this point, there was all this sort of you know, this right. tension around what was going to happen, and exactly. And, um, that's kind of, it's kind of interesting to create that, you know, by getting the actors and getting the, the scene set and the actors to work through that. Uh, because you have to be thinking about what the audience reaction is, but what what you want the audience uh, to mm -hmm. feel. So, do you think this guy is kind of working on this this idea of here's what here's what I'm going to deliver to you, mm -hmm. and this is the way I want you mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to take it? And because that in 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 a, in a certain way that that's a pretty high level mm -hmm. artistic. Uh, um, 
accomplishment to mm-hmm. be able to sort of map out the mm-hmm. tension that rises, mm-hmm. give them some relief, and yeah. then uh, kind of do that over and over again. Mm-hmm. And as the whole theme is built up there and get mm-hmm. the audience not only to mm-hmm. be horrified a little bit, but maybe even mm-hmm. uh, laugh and happy well, at, at it's another time. Because um, sort of to tell you, if you want to bring some, some, uh, some psychology into it, there, Daniel Stern did a lot of research with infants and moms, and he talks about how um, we we um, we create these uh, rising rhythmic tensions with infants. So we have a way of you know, like even the way we peekaboo, peekaboo, you know. And there's right. all these sorts of things that we do, yeah. And that all art um, from then on sort of build on this, the way our nervous system has an anticipation. Hmm. And you can say you can see that you know Tarantino is is a master of performing that level of peekaboo. There there are these tensions. You're not really sure what to expect. Uh, I mean, I think we could expect that something horrible is going to happen. Right. But, but right. It, once again, it was that, that he, he he and he also has a way of um, of his dialogue. There's something about Tarantino dialogue that is um, uh, they were comparing it to some of the. Um, Horrible detective guys, film noir um, novels and whatnot. Elmore Leonard, I think, is someone that they often connect, that they say is, is similar. But, you know, you could just watch a Tarantino film with people speaking, and it would also generate uh, tension and interest. I mean, so there's something about that, his his ability to be able to string together a narrative with all that tension but also his, his ability to get right. people to speak and how they speak. I mean, right, and, the, and to leave that anticipation out mm-hmm. there, sort of hanging sometimes, mm-hmm. and you have to deal with it. You have to uh, get some relief from that kind of thing, too. So I don't know. what. Well, like uh, you had no expectations going into the movie. You hadn't yeah. seen anything, heard anything about it other than me saying, hey, you got to see it. We need to well, talk about it. I heard that Bruce it, Lee, the, I'd gotten the thing that people <laughs> were upset about Bruce Lee, so I, I, I knew that was going to happen. It was, uh, and it was kind of, kind of shaming of Bruce Lee, but uh, you know, yeah, a little bit. But hey, once upon a time, okay, that may not have happened. Uh, But, but according, I did read something about that 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 folks actually said there was this guy that they modeled this on, and he was a bruiser, and he probably would have inflicted some pain, uh, even on Bruce Lee. So there there may be some truth to some of that. I don't. It's not my opinion. I read it somewhere else, but. Um, it was kind of interesting, and and you know Bruce Bruce Lee come, came across sometimes uh, back in the day. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't I don't much about. All I remember as a kid, this legend that he could reach into you your mouth and pull out your beating heart and show it to you. Yes, sir, yeah. I remember <laughs> I remember being told that as a kid, and I thought, wow, that's how does he? That's, him, that's I think I think the the <laughs> one of the, the sort of hallmarks was the um, the movement with the fingers like. <laughs> Come on, bring your best, bring your, uh, bring your best shot here. So and then, uh, uh, and then it it went it it went awry. I, I mean, I I could see where, you know, um, some of the narrative around the Bruce Lee thing is that, is that Tarantino is, um, is, um, uh, it is a white male fantasy that he's attempting to construct, and he's right, keeping at bay, um, you know, um, feminized sexuality and. Um, um, uh, and, and um, non-white Bruce Lee's an Asian man, um, and that that um, ultimately it's sort of a fascistic, sort of conservative um, uh, narrative, fantasy narrative that he's constructed, and maybe there's truth to that, but I think in some ways it's like um, I think he wanted to create a world that we could all just go back to. And in light of all the things that are going on now, global warming, politics, and whatnot, he wanted to create a space where you you had some control over, and even he was aware, by the way he titled it, that right. this oh, yeah. really is, this yes. is, this is going to be, it's going to be, it, in some ways, it's, it's going to be like the TV pilots you used to watch when you, when, back when TV was black and white, because they're, they're in the background and all these things too, you know, yeah. bounty sure. justice and all these yeah. sorts of things. And I think he just wanted to create that space. In some ways, it's um, there's a guy by the name of John Steiner who talks. He calls them psychic retreats, and they're the ways in which we sort of buttress ourselves by uh, defensively from needing to experience certain things, usually as a result of trauma. So I think of this as sort of a, you know, Tarantino wanted to live there, and he's hoping you might want to stay there with him for a while. But in the end, it ends, 
And right. its very ending throws into relief the very thing that he was attempting to... Uh, the outline of trauma is often more horrifying than the actual trauma. Right. And I think there's something about the outline he leaves at the end. Interesting. Well, he certainly has, um, has uh, uh, created a, a very interesting movie at this point. And um, I, I'm, I'm thinking, too, that he said that this might be... He may do one more movie after this. So he's like, this well, is my... he's slated to do a Star Trek film. So, okay, all right. I don't know. Uh, I can only How imagine <laughs> what that's going to look like. All that's I when the say, Klingons really get rough with <laughs> yeah. people. So. Well, if, if, if he falls into this trend, he may rewrite some Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know what... Uh, yeah, Captain Kirk's not going to look so good in this <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, right? might be. A, and I wouldn't want to be a red shirt on, uh, in this... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you did. I don't think I knew what to expect uh, in this movie, but I think that was a good thing because it allowed you to kind of be open to the experience and yeah, just kind yeah. of let this let this thing play out. And uh, if you could connect with certain pieces of it, it seems like to me that there was so many different things going on that anybody connected in that time frame who lived in that time or even those who weren't looking at it could draw some conclusions and even relate to some of the various pieces that, that came up. So. Well, somebody said that Tarantino was about six years old when this movie took place, something like that, is six that right? or eight. And so, in a way, he is constructing a space that he never really lived in. Right. But I could see where it, you know, if there was a retreat in this, if there's a way that where the good guys could win, where the man men could be manly, and uh, and even the character of we didn't we haven't talked a lot about the Margot Robbie character, but she actually has very few lines. Most right. of what she does is look attractive and sort of be fashionable and whatnot. But she represents sort of, um, you know, the old-style Hollywood starlet. Mm -hmm. She represents almost this sort of timeless beauty. Um, if we were to talk about mm -hmm. it, um, sh she is um, she is in a way the sort of thing that the movie sort of swirls around. Right. Um, and uh, she may represent, you know... Uh, the uh, personification of the very Hollywood that he's sort of recreating and trying to preserve, and I think that's interesting too. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, how would how would you um, how would you rate this movie on the ones that you've seen the last year well, or so? Well, it's, it's and funny because I uh, I, uh, I I keep chewing on it, and so I think about a film. If a if a film can make me keep thinking, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, like if like I was I was. Playing disc golf, and in the middle of playing disc golf, I suddenly thought, "Wait a minute, what about all those TVs in that movie?" And I started thinking about that. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's you know, um, I think it's I think it's an excellent film. It's uh, one of Tarantino's best. I, th I think I so find, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. some of his films are so tied up in the gr grindhouse uh, narrative right. that um, it's hard to walk away maybe with as much to chew on. I think. There were elements of Inglorious Bastards that you could chew on, and I, I haven't seen this, the two uh, films prior to this one, but um, yeah, uh, and, Hateful uh, Eight, I think, yeah. brutal. Yeah, if I may uh, just <laughs> well, warn you ahead. Inglorious Bastards uh, is pretty rough too, but I can only imagine. No, the, no, I think this one tops that a little that bit. The, That's uh, just my thought, but yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, go go easy into that one. But yeah, so well, how, what would you, how would you rate? What would you say? I, I liked it a lot. I related mm -hmm. to it, that narrative, lived through that time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I have many uh, criticisms really about it. Uh, there, one might be that during that time, and I was just getting out of, I was in the last year of high school, and I went, I got a uh, draft number, had to go for the, uh, to get, go through the physical because um, I was about to be shipped off to mm -hmm. Vietnam because mm -hmm. that war was was a big thing that was going mm -hmm. on at the time. And there's very little mention of that. Yes, yeah, in, in fact, it, it, and, and I, by not mentioning it, again, I think that also generates a different sort of tension because you're right. Nobody. That was uh, the main thing going yeah. on at that point, particular point yeah. in time, yeah. And even the music that plays in the background, there is this, uh, again, this is another thing I thought about while playing. I think I was yes. emptying dishes. Yes. Um, there's a moment where. Sharon Tate says to Roman Polanski, you don't want people to be embarrassed that you're listening to uh, um, Paul Revere and the Raiders. Or is it Herman's Herman? I think it's Paul Revere and the Raiders. Right, yes, Paul Revere. And, yeah. and uh, because, you know, they're even listening to music that is depoliticized, desexualized. That's 
Paul Revere and the Raiders are the least protest music you could possibly listen to <laughs> in a, generic in a time when that's, that you know. When well, yeah, and, and it was a funny thing because as that was about to play, and they said Paul Revere and the Raiders, I was, I was drawn into that too, uh, thinking of what song I was about to hear and what song I wanted to hear. Uh, as a result, didn't play it, of course. But uh, it was like, wow, well, okay, there's, I, I can relate a little bit. And even then, I think that there's even a, a like... We we don't mention the Vietnam War. We don't the music and the music is is one of the main characters of the film or the music. Tarantino often makes good use of music, but um, no real mention of the Vietnam War. Uh, the music is not the sort of protest music that you'd at least be seeing the tail end of at that time. Right. Um, hippies are um, are um, on the yeah could have done a <laughs> lot with the. With the music from 1969. Yeah, it's not okay. Uh, he decided not to do that. Maybe. Yeah, it's uh, not. You know, Woodstock it wouldn't was, fit. Wasn't what, what? What year was? Was that Woodstock? Was I think that was the same year, right? Yeah, it isn't the it's same. It is because it's, it's 50 years. 50 years. So, so it's 69. Literally, so, yeah. it's been excised. It, it, this is a counter narrative. You really could. I mean, Jimi <laughs> Hendrix, The Who, all right. of those guys. Are, oh so my he's goodness, generated okay. a fairy tale that literally rewrites history, and it's a counter narrative in so many ways. And um, I think that in of itself is kind of interesting. You can you can look at all the different elements that are sort of counter to what was really going on at the time, and all these. When there are several scenes where the stores and the shops that are sort of quintessential Hollywood are coming online, and there's something about that. Like you know, and there was also two two, and I, I thought about this also when I was, I think I was, putting the dishes up too. <laughs> there are two references by uh, Sharon Tate. She's trying to let she was in the Valley of the Dolls, and she's trying to let them know who which character she played, and the guy couldn't guess her. And so she's the one that went on to do right. dirty movies. And then there's a scene where they're going to a restaurant, Roman Polanski and the two other folks that they're friends with. And there's a big premiere in the background. She goes, what is that? Oh, that's so-and-so at the theater. It's a dirty movie. And she said, dirty movies have premieres? So even those wow. are in, where they're, you know, things like porn, which the there was a brief flirtation in Hollywood with porn being a legitimate art form. 70s porn is known for actually being movies. And... That's also marginalized. It's only something in the background. It doesn't. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, do, I really do wonder about the, his thought process. Was was he taking intentionally taking those things out and saying that might interfere with my narrative, mm -hmm. and um, I don't want you to kind of go back in and mm -hmm. hear that song that was uh, popular because that's going to take you to another place. Mm -hmm. well, that was interesting. You know, one, one of the other things that I noticed in this uh, that I wondered about, he kept he he flashed up the dates. Mm -hmm. He put the date, oh, the yeah. month of the year, and mm -hmm. I, and I'm I'm thinking that took place, was it September, August or September, um, that the Sharon Tate. Uh, oh, no, he took place. was gone six months to do the November? to I'm do sorry, the the four films because I think it went and and then it and, and I got the sense that because he was tracking us through yeah. the time frame with this, so, the, so like leading up a, to yeah it. there's a moment we're about to get to and. Um, yeah, yeah. That I mean, that also that generated a certain tension too, like where this is. The, the where, clock was ticking. The yeah, dates were ticking. We down are to uh, this. okay. Something yeah. will happen. Something's about to happen. Prepare mm -hmm. yourself for that. All right, man. So um, you going to see it again? Uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I have. Um, <laughs> there might my, be my, some others. Well, my of. my. I often don't have two and a half hours to uh, see a film. <laughs> we were lucky, my wife and I, to to to, to be able to sneak away. So, uh, oh, but I would. Great. There's also some other, you know, good flicks coming down the the pike too. I am, um, and I'm hoping to. Uh, they advertise some things that looked interesting on a, including a comedy involving a funny Hitler. I don't know. Uh, okay. If you, saw, if you saw that if you were there for the previews for it, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh yes, uh, funny Hitler. All right, that's been done, but uh, we'll do it again. All right, all right, my friend. Thank you so much. It's I cool. appreciate the time. Talk about that Tarantino movie. We'll have to do some more stuff coming out. The things that are out QT. there. And kind of figure out what Freud said about that. Mm -hmm. and then, all right, I guess. Let's stop there. I'll, I'll see, see you next time. Next time. Next time. Next time.